Yay. Okay. Um, so to get out, um, to get started, um, just humor me for a second. And imagine a reality where a small piece of skin or a few milliliters of blood um, could dramatically change how scientists study and understand the human condition. Imagine that those humble starting materials, those simple building blocks, could ultimately generate a tool that could help us understand um, the processes of aging and development and also unlock um, key discoveries around how diseases occur and are manifested in a human population. Imagine that those exact same starting materials, um, a few mils of blood, a small piece of skin, could also provide um, therapeutic applications for some of the most devastating diseases that affect the human population. So the spoiler alert is that we really don't have to imagine this, right? Um, the reality is um, scientists throughout an international um, research community have been rapidly developing techniques to generate and utilize patient-specific stem cells generated from skin and blood for well over a decade. Stem cells that have the power to drive scientific discovery and therapeutic applications. <laughs> so incredibly early in human development, there is a unique stem cell that is poised to develop or differentiate into all of the unique cell types in the human body. Developmental biologists and stem cell biologists describe this unique developmental state as pluripotency. Through the process of differentiation, pluripotent stem cells ultimately give rise to the unique cell types that comprise tissues, tissues that make up organs, organs that or, um, interact into organ systems, and organ systems that ultimately give rise to complex organisms like us. We can imagine this pluripotent stem cell as a ball perched at the top of a very large and undulating hill. As that stem cell is notched um, or um, nudged from the top of the hill, intrinsic factors um, from the landscape, from the topography, from the slope of that hill, ultimately influence gene expression that drives these cells into unique lineages, representing all the unique cell types in the human body. For the very, very longest time, this process of differentiation, this process of development was thought to be a one-way street. Essentially, as the stem cell rolled down the hill and made it to its final cell product, at no point would it ever come back to an intermediate stage in the hill, and absolutely in no case would it make it all the way back to the very top of the hill. In 2006, though, a, um, a Japanese um, scientist by the name of Shinya Yamanaka shocked the scientific world and elegantly showed that through the overexpression of just four key genes, you could take a permanently differentiated cell and revert it all the way back to the early stages of human development. For the very, very first time, we saw that a permanently mature, permanently developed, permanently differentiated cell can be reverted all the way back to the pluripotent state. Dr. Yamanaka named this process induced pluripotency. He named the cell product that he produced from this induced pluripotent stem cells. And since 2006, this um, model of induced pluripotent stem cells has revolutionized how scientists approach and understand the human condition. For this groundbreaking discovery, Dr. Yamanaka was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2012. So what does this reprogramming process look like? Um, at the core of it is an individual is a unique person with a unique genetic background. Through the process of, inform of informed consent, these individuals um, um, donate a small piece of skin through a punch biopsy process, um, can donate a few mils of blood. There's also a few other cell sources that we can have access to to start out here. In the context of the punch biopsy, which is what we primarily do here at the Salk Institute, um, that um, small piece of tissue, roughly three millimeters in diameter, can be treated overnight with enzymes to break apart the cells in that tissue. Those cells are essentially plated out onto a plastic surface, fed with an appropriate liquid media that allows those cells to expand. We can then um, uh, bank those cells back and freeze them and have them for a prolonged period of time in storage. From there, we can wake up one of those frozen vials of cells, overexpress those four key genes. This is not working so great for me. Typically, this modality of overexpression utilizes viruses that have been stripped of all of their pathogenic parts, and we're just primarily using them as a vehicle to jump, dump genetic information into cells, something viruses do very well on their own. 
after we introduce those, yeah? Overexpressed, great. So um, um, when we have genes in the body um, that are actively being transcribed and translated, there's an endogenous level of expression that happens. We could view that as kind of a normal amount, right? Oftentimes, to produce a biological effect in the system or force a change, we have to amplify that um, amount of expression. Um, and so that's kind of the idea of overexpression, right? So we, we're, we're exceeding that kind of basal level that you would see. Or, in some cases, a cell type will not express that gene at all, and we can force that cell to express that gene. Is and so, increasing signal uh, so it, it happens in a few different modalities. Oftentimes, um, if you're using integrating viral vectors, you are putting multiple copies of a specific gene into the genome in areas that are open and can't be transcribed, right? Um, and the modalities we use for this reprogramming process, we're typically taking a different approach because we want to avoid inserting permanent genetic information into the human genome. And so what we do in this context is use specialized viruses that dump in a payload of mRNA um, that can be translated over time. Um, and that amps the expression of these key factors, right? And so it's, it's, there's a few different modalities you can take with that. Um, um, you can also do this through the simple just um, uh, transfection or, you know, just introduction of genetic material without a viral vector um, through um, processes that um, allow you to encapsulate um, genetic material in a little bubble of fat that can fuse with the plasma membrane and dump that information into the cell. Um, and so there's also mechanisms to do it that way. Um, yeah, but at, 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 the, at the nutshell of this, at the very basic level, we are either forcing the expression of a gene that is not expressed in these cells, or there's a basal level of expression that we want to overcome, right? Yeah, very good question. So after we um, introduce these four key factors using this special Sinai virus vector that just dumps in RNA, um, we can wait about four weeks. And over that four week period, we start to see structures like this start to emerge. These tightly compact colonies that are comprised of multiple very, very small cells that have these very, very well-organized boundaries. From there, we can manually isolate these um, colonies. These are our induced pluripotent stem cells. Those stem cells are then expanded, characterized to say that we know they came from individual X, we know that they're in pluripotent, we know that they can generate every cell type in the human body, and then we also bank them. And this entire process takes about two to three months. And at the end of it, we are left with something that isn't very exciting, a singular vial of cells, just frozen material that we throw into a liquid nitrogen storage and let it sit until we need it for a project. But in that frozen vial of cells, we have a stem cell population that has the capacity to do a lot of amazing things. And one of the very, very cool things we use these stem cells for here at the Salk Institute is this idea of disease modeling or disease in a dish. And I'll walk you through that paradigm here quickly. Um, to start out, let's, let's, let's go back to this understanding that this entire process starts with a unique individual with a unique genetic background, right? If I take a small piece of your skin, I reprogram that into an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then I differentiate that induced pluripotent stem cell into a neuron or a heart muscle or any other cell type we could possibly imagine, that final cell product is going to contain all of the genetic information that makes you unique. So if we apply this in the cons, yeah. Is there, say that one more time. Uh, a concept of ownership. Ah, of yes. Are you talking like at what point is it mine and not yours? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a really great question. So classically, the, this, this varies depending on the regulatory body you kind of talk to or the state government entity you're working with, um, either domestic or international. But the, the, the common understanding is that when you give me fibroblasts, they're yours, right? If you give me your cells, they're yours. And you've signed consent that says I can do things with them. Once I've done something to them and created something new from that, that is mine um, and no longer yours. That's kind of the, the kind of common understanding. And there's some gray area in there sometimes. Um, and it also comes down to how consent documents are written and worded. Um, sometimes consent documents can be worded in such a way that would give you ownership to that material throughout the entire process that it's ever used in. 
Um, and so um, there's, there's a lot of gray area there. But um, yeah, that's the, the typical understanding in most cases. If it's your cells, it's yours. Once I've done something to it, it's mine. Yeah, yeah. And by mine, it's really the institutes, right? I don't, I don't own anything, <laughs> right? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. And maybe I just missed it, but I get this, induction, this uh, induced pluripotency, but then did you say you can direct the differentiation? Oh, absolutely, okay. yeah. So that's the entire power of this technology. So just having a pluripotent stem cell floating up at the top of the hill in right. the ether, yeah. that's, that's a tool. That's not really an application, right? To turn it into an application, we have to direct that cell type into something that's interesting to us. And so there are well-established protocols, well-established paradigms to specifically direct a pluripotent stem cell into a lot of different relevant cell types for studying a wide variety of diseases, development, aging, you name it, right? Um, so um, cells of the central nervous system, um, cells of the pancreas, cells of the liver, cells of the gut, skin, bone, heart muscle, skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, you name it. Pretty much any cell type in the human body you can, you can theoretically generate from these induced pluripotent stem cells. As long as you have kind of the right, you know the right signals to expose it to over time to force it into that, you know, specific cell lineage. Yeah. Yep. And that's how they're Yeah, so in the context of what we do, this is often informed by very historic studies that were done in flies, mice, right? Where people have just teased apart basic networks that are required, basic gene networks that are required to kind of direct cells. And then we can take that, read a bunch of literature, and say, okay, I think these genes are involved. Um, what um, you know, small protein messages, what transcription factors can I treat that with that would um, you know, um, cause those genes to turn on, right? What small molecules can I treat that with that would inhibit specific gene expression that I don't want to see or promote gene expression that I do want to see, right? And so we can kind of approach it from that context and treat it with the right chemicals over time and direct the sulfate. Um, in a really kind of uh, developmentally based paradigm. Um, it does not happen on that time scale though. Um, typically when we do differentiations, they happen in the scale of weeks to months, not years. Um, and so it is, we're kind of doing it a little bit faster than it would happen you know, in normal human development, um, but it's, we're essentially following that same program path that you would see in development, yeah. Yeah. So uh, getting back to the context of Alzheimer's disease, um, we kind of left off with this idea that if I generated a neuron from an iPS cell that generated from you, that, that neuron would have all the genetic information that makes you unique. So if we expand that out into the context of individual, an, an, an individual with a disease, we can really see the power of this technology start to emerge. So for our example here, we have a patient with Alzheimer's disease. We take a small piece of their skin. We generate induced pluripotent stem cells. We differentiate those into neurons, and those are, in fact, neurons generated from iPS cells. We've done staining with those for um, antibody markers that can tag specific proteins that exist only in neurons. And so that green you're seeing there is um, a protein that only exists in neurons that that antibody stain is targeting. And those neurons will ultimately have all the genes that started here. And so I have, ultimately, a dish full of neurons that have all the genes that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. And if we do this just right, <laughs> ideally we end up with a plate full of neurons that actually behaves like Alzheimer's disease neurons and provides us a unprecedented model to really access not only the cellular and molecular mechanisms that cause a disease to happen, but also give us a very, very um, specialized platform to start saying, how can we intervene in this? What FDA-approved FDA therapeutics already exist that can improve those defects that we see in these models? Okay. Yeah. So is that what you're talking about, like rather than years, um, weeks, or, or months? Um, I was thinking that you were just generating good, healthy neurons yeah. and then putting them in to replace to help a Alzheimer's patient. Right. Yeah, so um, there, there are two things here that I'll address. Um, so the, the first element of your question was this idea of cell replacement therapy. That is absolutely the goal of this technology. Um, um, and so um, this is very much happening now and currently being developed. Um, there's not really a iPS-based 
cell therapy available in the marketplace right now. Um, but there are groups, um, a, lot of, a lot of that is happening in Japan, um, that are using iPSC-based um, cell um, lines to generate um, cell types in what we call an autologous fashion, where I generate your cells that go back into you, and it kind of avoids any issues with immune rejection. Um, to counter that, um, there are embryonic stem cell-based therapies that are currently being FDA um, um, clinical trial um, tested in the United States right now. Um, a lot of those center around spinal injury, macular degeneration, and diabetes um, currently. And so the idea that you can use a pluripotent stem cell to generate a cell population and then present that back to an individual to kind of rejuvenate, repair, replace damaged cells, damaged tissue. Yeah. I guess part of the question too I was asking is like, how do you get it to um, necessarily become these um, uh, cells that are representing Alzheimer's and do it as quickly? Start here, right? So if I start with a patient that has Alzheimer's disease. So it's definitive. Yep, it's diagnosed, so right? It's well, it's, Alzheimer's is a weird thing where it's never definitive until there is a post-mortem you know, analysis of the brain to show that you have the aggregation of the plaques um, in the brain. Um, and so it's probable Alzheimer's, they display the characteristics of memory loss, um, um, cognitive dysfunction that a um, neuro, neuroscientist or a, a neurologist can identify as AD. That just seems yeah. to be proving the um, genetic predisposition. Right. right. Yeah. Yep, yep. So this is hinging under the assumption that the basis of a condition is going to be mostly genetic, this, this technology. Um, in the context of a lot of diseases, the struggle with identifying genomic connections is that they are diverse and unique to every individual and context of that disease, right? Um, this is especially true with cancer um, um, and very, very true with a lot of the neurodegenerative disorders. There is a suite of kind of gene dysfunction that is involved in these pathologies. And it's not one gene or a set of known five genes. It's the breakdown of a bunch of different things that happens. Um, there are often environmental factors involved in that. The induced pluripotent stem cell process itself is not very great at capturing those. Um, in the Q&A, though, I would love for you to ask me about cell systems that are, and I can talk to you about some really new novel technologies that are being developed um, where we can essentially take a skin cell, skip this iPSC intermediate, and go directly into a cell type of interest, and those do capture environmental, um, environmental signals. Yeah. Yeah. You guys are asking such great questions. I'm yeah. sorry. I know. Yeah. I'm sure you're probably going to get to slides where they answer them. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So, <laughs> Um, if I'm hearing you correctly, are you saying that um, like the sequence of an Alzheimer's um, patient might look differently from the sequence of another Alzheimer's patient? Yeah, absolutely. Or the, ge the, genetic, the genetic basis for that disease, the underlying genomic dysfunction that you know, is causal to that is, is going to be unique and varied. So you could never... You could never take this biopsy from a person and say, oh, I see this sequence here that is typical of Alzheimer's patients. <laughs> so you can do that if you see enough of them. Okay. Um, and you can um, generate mechanisms that allow you to tease apart the fact that that genomic issue is specifically resulting in a phenotype. And, and, you know, kind of the dysfunction you're seeing in the cells, right? So this right? stuff is being read by programs looking uh, There is a lot of automation. I mean, like, the, 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 it, to, to do this with the amount of numbers you need to make meaningful observations that are, you know, implicated to the genomic level, like, you need scale yeah. to do that, right? Um, and so not only, like, quantity of material, but numbers of individuals. And I'll get to this um, later in the presentation, too, with a really cool project we've done with some researchers at UCSD. Um, um, but yeah, you, you just need a lot of genetic diversity. You need a lot of individuals. You need a lot of ins, right? A lot of subjects to make that happen, right? Yeah. Um, but it is absolutely possible, and people are starting to develop automated high throughput paradigms to do this disease modeling context, um, which is really cool and what I'm um, especially excited about for the future of this technology. Um, okay, so. Um, 
that, that was our kind of basic example um, of, of how this can be used in the context of disease modeling. But I want to give you a real world one, one that happened here at the Salk Institute. And this was an incredibly early um, paper that came out um, right on the heels of some of these original discoveries that we can generate induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, and this came from um, Dr. Rusty Gage's lab here at the Salk Institute. And a postdoc in his lab who's now um, uh, faculty at Mount Sinai in New York, um, Kristen Brennan, um, was able to generate a super elegant model of schizophrenia. So what Kristen did is she compiled a cohort in collaboration with local clinicians of individuals who had schizophrenia, and then also a subset of individuals that did not, but were matched in age and in sex. And so you could kind of, you know, take apart high five. Oh, intern, yep, I always forget that. I always forget that, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so um, Kristen um, identified these individuals. She got informed consent from them. She had the skin biopsies taken, and she processed the skin biopsies, generated induced pluripotent stem cells, and then turned them all into neurons, right? From there, um, Kristen did a really cool thing. And she utilized a viral tracing technology um, developed by another Salk scientist, Ed Calloway, which uses a rabies virus. Um, rabies virus is unique in that it can travel through a neural network. Um, and the technology that Dr. Calloway has developed allows, um, as that virus kind of moves to that neural network, it is forcing the expression of a fluorescent protein. And so you can monitor kind of how complex a network is by how much of that fluorescent protein you see in it, right? Um, and so what Kristen did um, is infected schizophrenic neurons and healthy neurons with this rabies virus. And she was able to show that the um, network is impaired in schizophrenic neurons. There's not as many connections in that neural network. The very, very cool thing that happened next, though, and really shows the utility of this technology, is once she made this observation, she said, huh, I wonder what one of the commonly used FDA-approved drugs that is used to skid, um, treat schizophrenia, what effect that has on this network, right? Does it change anything? And so Kristen took this drug, a drug called loxapine, treated the cells with it, and she was able to show that after the cells were treated with loxapine, she could ameliorate some of those effects of that damaged network and improve those connections to levels similar to what we're seeing in healthy neurons. Um, for the very first time, um, um, or not very first time, but um, this, this ultimately provided insights into how an FDA-approved drug actually worked at the cellular level, um, something that we don't always see. Clinicians will all the time prescribe drugs, and they know it has an effect, but they have no idea why, right? And this starts to give us understanding into why, what mechanisms of action these drugs are working through. And that ultimately gives rise to understanding to develop new therapeutics that can you know, be better at what they do, right? You mean get them all instead of leave a few behind? Get them all, not be as toxic, um, have less side effects, you name it, right? You can, you can kind of do all of this in IPS-based models. So um, we have primarily focused on diseases of the central nervous system. I just want to hammer home the idea that this technology is in no way limited to Alzheimer's or schizophrenia. You can use this to model essentially any disease you could possibly imagine. Here's just a smattering of what we've done at the Salk Institute. You will notice that a lot of these are neuropsychiatric or um, neurodegenerative conditions. Um, if you guys remember from Ellen's intro, that is a major focus of the Salk Institute, and so we have focused on that with a lot of our IPSC-based modeling. But we also have cystic fibrosis, depression, diabetes, hemophilia. We've had people study um, severe combined immunodeficiency. We've had people study progeria, which is a disease of premature aging. Um, and so you name it. You can utilize this technology to study it. Um, and that is really why Dr. Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize, because this stuff is immediately impactful in progressing our understanding of human health, right? Um, so we've talked about this complicated technology, and it seems really involved, right? You have to get a piece of skin. You have to do some witchcraft to overexpress those four key genes. There's these super involved processes to identify which cells are the right ones, to manually isolate those to characterize them, and then to finally differentiate them into their final cell product, right? That all seems outrageously complicated and pretty unattainable, right? Well, it's not. It, the reality is companies have generated 
incredibly reproducible kits and products you can essentially buy to do this entire workflow. Any lab with some basic training can essentially do this without too many problems, right? Um, and so you can buy kits that allow you to isolate blood. You can buy kits that contain the specialized Sendai viruses that force the overexpression of those four key genes. You can buy um, specialized medias that allow you to support those pluripotent cells in culture. Um, and finally, you can buy um, kits that allow you to you know, functionally characterize those cells and say they are pluripotent. They can generate any cell type in the human body. Um, so a lab with basic understanding of human cell culture techniques can essentially procure these resources and make this happen. Um, but the issue comes with scale, right? And so if you're doing this with five, six, seven, ten individuals, it's not too complicated. But what happens when you start to say, I want to do this with 250 individuals? There we start to have a problem with scale. Um, any of you guys who've ever baked you know when you double a recipe, quadruple a recipe, it doesn't always work out. You know, biology is the exact same way. Um, and um, we have the added issue on top of this that we are dealing with biology, which is really routine. And in the case of induced pluripotent stem cells, we're dealing with biology across a spectrum of individuals. And so we're seeing that variety of biology in the system there as well. And so we, we have to kind of take a step back and really look at this technology when we do it at scale because we still need it to be reproducible. We still need to get a similar result. We still need it to be effective with our time and our resources. And so how do we do that? And this is really where cores can step in, and spe specifically the stem cell core at the Salk Institute, and this is where I've existed since I've been here. And thinking about, we have this relatively complicated technique, but we need to make it, we need to make it reproducible and routine. Um, and so um, um, to do that, um, we have to rethink this paradigm, this linear paradigm of we have a skin cell, we generate IPS cell, we characterize it, we generate a cell type of interest. We have to rethink that completely um, because linear doesn't work well when you want to be reproducible and have high efficiency. And so what we've done is recreated this into something that's a little bit more cyclical where we have these um, defined silos of activity that we can rotate through with specialized, um, specially trained hands, technicians that have specific expertise, and produce these cell models in an incredibly efficient way with minimal resources, minimal costs, and minimal technician time. But still have the exact same high quality product that we need to make these awesome discoveries. So um, we have gotten really good at this over the last several years. And one kind of um, really awesome project that I alluded to earlier that resulted from us developing these kind of really more high throughput modalities for doing this process was a collaboration we had with Dr. Kelly Frazier at UCSD. So Dr. Frazier is a geneticist at um, UCSD and she was very, very interested in starting to understand um, some of the you know, genetic basis for cardiac disease. Um, and to do that, she recruited a patient cohort of roughly 220 individuals. At the center of that patient cohort were roughly 40 individuals with diagnosed um, cardiac issues, um, mostly arrhythmias. Um, but it wasn't just them. It was them and these highly branched family networks of these individuals. Um, and so, um, you know, maybe this is the uh, individual that had the disease. It would be their, you know, spouse, their parents, um, you know, their siblings, their children, all represented in cases where you had affected and uninfected individuals, people that were carriers for the disease but did not have symptoms. And so we have roughly 40 of these family groups across these um, 222 individuals, ultimately resulting in 143 genetically related individuals. This cohort is diverse ethnically, it's diverse in age, um, it is um, roughly 50-50 male-female. And so this is a resource that we can start to use to tease apart the genetic underpinnings of cardiac disease at a population level um, through these well-characterized you know, um, family networks. But to do that, we have to have well-established paradigms to take those pluripotent stem cells we've generated and to differentiate them into clinically relevant cell populations in this case, the beating muscle cells of the heart. This is a nice party trick that we like to do all the time, um, but it's absolutely relevant. Is this playing? Yeah. Yes, great. So these cells are called cardiomyocytes, cardio, heart, myo, muscle, site, cell, heart, muscle, cells. These cells, when they mature in the dish, 
have a spontaneous contractile activity. In the context of arrhythmias, this spontaneous contractile activity can be monitored and it is different compared to patients with arrhythmia and patients that do not. And so we have a metric, a phenotypic actual metric, a functional metric to measure to see what's happening in these, these, these diseases and conditions. And again, just like that model of schizophrenia, this can start as a platform to start doing drug screening as well. And this work is ongoing at Dr. Frazier's lab. They're progressing with this um, um, currently, and they're also looking at using this exact same patient cohort to do some um, uh, modeling of um, pancreatic diseases as well. Okay. Um, so um, what's next with these technologies, or what's happening now? What's kind of the bleeding edge of this? Um, and one of the really cool areas that Ellen alluded to earlier are so-called organoid technologies. So traditional modalities to model human disease in a dish with iPSC-based technologies um, typically relies on a very specific cell population or a monoculture of cells grown on a flat surface, right? Um, and this isn't the best way to approach disease often. Um, diseases oftentimes do not affect a single cell type, and the human body does not exist in two dimensions, right? Um, you know, um, so ultimately, um, systems need to be developed where you can generate um, models in 3D space that are comprised of the unique cell types represented in a tissue um, and use that small structure, that small organized structure, um, to be your cell-based model, right? And this is work that's been very, very popular recently in the stem cell community, and a lot of people are working on this. These are just a few examples of what's happening in the central nervous system with brain organoids, where we can generate small spheroids um, comprised of cells represented of the various layers of the brain, right? And use that as a three-dimensional model that captures you know, the heterogeneity of that tissue and of the cells that exist in it. And this can happen across a variety of tissue types. People have done this with heart, with lung. Dr. Evans Labs has done this with pancreas um, and the islet, the beta cells um, that secrete insulin. Uh, and so a ton of different modalities you can use this in. Um, so it's really kind of the bleeding edge of this technology right now. Combine this on top of some of the advanced gene editing CRISPR technologies you guys have probably heard of. We're really at a major, you know, kind of turning point in the stem cell field, where we have highly robust, highly reproducible models um, or, or techniques to generate these cells. Um, and we've generated a lot of induced pluripotent stem cells over the years. Here at the Salk Institute, we've done this routine with over 500 individuals since I started at the Institute in 2011. Um, but you know, the number of these lines that have been generated internationally is in the thousands of thousands and thousands and thousands, right? And so now these, these, these systems are getting put into these incredibly complex three-dimensional differentiation paradigms where we can generate not a single cell type but multiple cell types across three-dimensional space and then put them into these high-throughput assays to monitor changes like neural connectivity or you know, the beating activity of heart, right? Um, or insulin secretion, right? You name it. Um, and so really at a crux where we're really getting to a point to do a lot of very, very cool things. Yeah. I happen to have attended a session across the street yesterday, uh, Dr. Uh, Alyssa Watry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, Did he show you his robot arm? Uh, yeah. And the crowd convinced him to not use the term mini brain. Yes, yes. I actually do not like the word mini brain. Uh, I have never liked that. Um, yeah, so um, I prefer the like brain organoid, right? Like, it's not a mini brain. Like it is not nearly as organized. It it, it does not is not self aware, right? Um, but it is flashy and generates interest. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of the mini brain either. Um, I think it drives, you know, um, uh, misconception, right? And that's never a good thing, especially when you're doing stuff that's this kind of avant-garde, right? You know, being more clear is better than not, in my opinion. Um, um, so that's kind of where we are at now with this um, technology. Um, um, so that was, that's kind of the last decade of induced stem cell technologies. We've seen a fledgling technique mature into a highly reproducible process that is informing how we understand um, the process of aging development, especially disease unlocking the foundational mechanisms that underlie 
um, you know, disease pathologies, and also creating platforms, elegant platforms, to do drug-based screening on them. Cool. So where, where, where are we going next? Um, so there's just a few things I'd like to put out. Um, one is the, the you know, high, high throughput technologies. This is really starting to come together in a really elegant way. Biotech is starting to jump onto these technologies in, in aggressive ways and really, really develop you know, unique large sets of iPSCs that are relevant to a disease or condition and study toxicology um, in them, study um, you know, um, re resistance to drugs in them, study um, um, you know, therapeutic effects of drugs in them. So that's, that's all starting to happen. In, in a really elegant way right now. Um, there's also been um, a lot of talk around this induced pluripotent stem cell process is incredibly manual, incredibly hands-on. And while we have developed a very standard operating procedure around this that we can use reproducibly, at the end of the day, there's technicians' hands involved in this and oftentimes multiple people's hands involved. And when that happens, you're just inserting variability into the system just on its own. And so developing automated strategies can not only improve the efficiency of it, but pr 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 improve the reproducibility of it. And so there's been a lot of work um, ongoing now to kind of develop automated paradigms to do this entire procedure of the reprogramming process. Um, thus far, it's been kind of challenging to do those in elegant ways, but people are starting to get over those hurdles. And lastly, a really, a really fun one that I like to think about a lot is as we see induced pluripotent stem cells jump towards clinical applications, um, the reality of doing this in a truly autologous fashion like we talked about earlier can start to be a little bit unrealistic because it, it takes a certain amount of time to generate the cell lines and characterize them. And then we have to turn them into something, show that we turned them into the right cell, characterize that to the extent that the FDA wants, and then put it back into you. And that's, that's an incredibly long process. What is more interesting to me is thinking about collecting um, um, cohorts of super donors that have, will have minimal um, you know, immune reactivity um, to a wide variety of patients and doing that process with them. And so having you know, a collection of you know, uh, hundreds of individuals represented of specific groups of people that you can use for these um, therapeutic applications that have already been kind of pre-screened and covered for FDA purposes and using these super donor banks. Um, for um, these iPSC therapeutic resources. And so that's, that's a really um, fun one that people are starting to think about as well. Um, and I would argue, just to hammer the point home, that um, core facilities are going to be at the corner of all of this and at the center of all of this. In that, um, in cores, there is a specialized, committed expertise to kind of doing the not flashy, elegant stuff sometimes, but looking at a process, taking it apart, making it better, making it more efficient, right? And so people like me that run core facilities like this throughout the world are gonna be at, at the center of advancing these technologies and really pushing, pushing these technologies into um, the next era. Yeah. Go back to the part about the banks of super donors. So yeah. This be the idea that instead of having people's own DNA, yeah. you would have a pool of... Yeah, instead of putting your cells back into you, there would be a pool of individuals that are um, just due to their you know, unique genetic factors um, would be less predisposed to having immune rejection in you, right? Um, this would be in the context of a therapeutic application, right? Yeah, just because if, if you just think about the logistics of making a cell therapy directly from you, that is gonna be very, very complicated, right? And maybe there's isolated circumstances where that can be done quickly with a specific disease indication. Um, but if you want to have um, you know, um, a kind of widely available source of iPS cells that have been validated by several governmental agencies just available for people to access and start to use as the basis for a therapeutic paradigm, that, that becomes something that progresses timelines and efficiency of this technology instead of always coming back to the individual. right? Right. Yep. So typically when people think about this, they think about it in the context of kind of um, subsets of biodiversity, right? 
So taking kind of unique, you know, um, ethnic geographic populations and saying, we know that these people are not going to be exactly the same as these people. And so we will generate a collection of iPSCs that re mostly represent, you know, 90% of the variability seen in this one group, right? And so you end up with several collections to represent, you know, the human population, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's actually been a lot of work um, under this. This is the idea of haplobanking. So if you ever want to look this up, just Google haplobanking. But there's been a lot of work under this about the haplo, H-A-P-L-O. Haplotype? Banking. Yeah, haplobanking. Um, so this, this idea that um, um, these subsets of individuals could represent most of the human population and have appropriate, you know, HLA signatures that would make them not be aggressively immune rejected, right? Um, and so um, a, a lot of people have done a lot of work on this to kind of estimate the numbers you would need for given populations, right? Um, and so like uh, there's like benchmarks that we, we know we need at least 40 individuals to capture. I'm just spitting out numbers. These aren't really real. But you know, people have done work where they can say, we know we need at least 40 individuals to capture 90% of their diversity in a Caucasian population or you know, a Pacific Asian population, right? Um, and so people have done work on this. Um, and that's kind of starting to seep into iPSC technologies and inform how you can make iPSC cell lines under good manufacturing practices that can be widely available to you know, people who are interested in developing therapies, right? Um, and I, I should point out that there are broader overseeing stem cell organizations that are very, very involved in this. Um, um, so the International Stem Cell Banking Initiative um, is at the center of this, um, and there's um, a few others as well. Um, and so there's kind of um, interest groups of r individuals that are powering, you know, that kind of this, this uh, development of these haplobanks banks in the context of IPSCs. Yeah. You suggested that um, you should characterize diversity by ethnicity and geography. Yeah. Is there a biological basis for what we call race? No, there is no biological basis for race. Um, yeah. Um, that was that was a big thing that came out of the Human Genome Project way back when. Yeah. yeah ethnicity and geography. Um, yeah. So I mean, there is um, there is when when you're looking at finding these super donors, right? You need to do that in a context um, to avoid immune rejection, um, to have that appropriate HLA signature to be matched, and to do that in a way that is kind of safe and productive. You have to kind of look at bins of ethnic groups to do that. Are there, are there dimensions other than ethnicity and geography? Um, no, I guess, two. I guess geography was just kind of my euphemistic way of saying ethnicity as well, yeah. Oh, so, so yeah, it's just really ethnicity, yeah. So if like people of, you know, you know, Eastern European descent, people of East Asian descent, people of, you know, you know, whatever, right? You, you can kind of imagine that. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, um, what might that look uh, like as we become more and more? That is such a fantastic question. Um, I would encourage you to look up those Apple banking resources and see what they say about that. I haven't dug into that, but that is a very fantastic question. So as we kind of start to be more of a mixing pot, you know, um, what what does that look like, right? Yeah, yeah that is a fantastic question. Yep. Okay, so at the very, very beginning of the presentation, I asked you guys to imagine, um, and we had this idea of looking at this, this slope. Um, uh, and, and the kind of ball rolling back up the hill. And so I do want to take a step back and really get back to kind of some basic understandings that were at the core of what inspired Shinya Yamanaka, Shinya Yamanaka um, to make this original discovery um, and, you know, gave him the foundation to make it on, right? Um, and um, this was my sad, sad representation of something that a British um, biologist um, made back in the 1950s uh, by the name of Conrad Waddington. And so Waddington originally um, was faced with this question that we have in, um, a lot of um, unique cell types in the human body, but you know, theoretically all this is starting from a cell population, you know, or, but all these cells share the same genetic information, right? So how do cells that share the exact same genetic information get the signals to, to develop into the unique things that they are. 
And so what Waddington proposed originally was his idea of this landscape, this epigenetic landscape. So factors outside of the ATCG that influence the expression of genes. And Waddington described his epigenetic landscape similar to what I did, but in this case he had a ball at the top of a valley. And as that ball rolled down the valley, it would be exposed to topography in that hill, forcing that ball left or right. Ultimately, pushing that ball down to one of these final self states, right? And so this is, this is Waddington's original imagination of this. Waddington did this way back in the 1950s. This is before we know a lot about um, how, how genes are organized in the body, how they're transcribed and translated, what regulates those processes, what, what molecules are involved in that. This, this, this happened way before all of that. And he just really dared to imagine what this could look like. But in doing so, um, he establishes a kind of base for other research to start work with. This is the underside of Waddington's epigenetic landscape, and he uses um, this model to describe what causes that, that topography of the hill. So essentially you have genes, specific genes, that are kind of tethered to some plane, and these genes are connected into the landscape through these guy wires, um, and based on the force of that expression, the force of that network um, defines whether that guy wire is taut or loose, and that ultimately causes that epigenetic landscape to change, right? To be molded, to form, right? Um, what Waddington really didn't know when he proposed this is what this would look like and how this would look. Um, it's very interesting to know what we know now and say that it looks a lot like this. Single genes considered master regulators or pioneering factors, influence networks. So it's not a single gene influencing the landscape directly, but it goes through a network of different interactions to ultimately influence this. The other really cool thing is this is kind of the top of the hill here. Waddington accidentally identified four. What I can tell you now is when Shin Yamanaka originally did this, um, he started out with 24 individual factors that he thought might induce the pluripotent state. Through a process of doing reductive screening, he was able to nibble that down to 10, and then nibble those 10 down to four. Um, and ultimately, we're left with the four canonical Yamanaka factors that have not changed since that original discovery. And this is me being very romantic, um, but I would like to think that you know, Waddington maybe had an idea that that was gonna happen. So right at the front of this landscape, right at the top of the hill, if we pull on those hard enough, we can invert that entire landscape and cause that ball to roll back up the hill. And so kind of the, the, the big thing I want to leave you with with taking this step back is at the center of the last decade of induced pluripotent stem cell technologies is really this original observation from Waddington, where he started out with this, 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 his observation that we have huge numbers of cell types that are representing the human body, but they're, they're not genetically diverse. And so how does that happen? So from there, he applied a sense of wonder and dared to imagine and created a model that other people could start to use as the basis for understanding what may or may not be happening in these systems. A model that ultimately defined the last decade of induced pluripotent stem cell biology and is still defining the field today. Um, all, all kind of starting with this single idea of Waddington's landscape and his idea of epigenetics and how that influenced human development. So oftentimes we think about scientists being kind of this crude, analytical, data-driven modality. Now I'd like to encourage everyone to take a step back and see the art in it and to really dare to wonder and to be imaginative and to express that to your students as we think about generating models and thinking about what good scientific questions are. They really start here, with making an observation, having a sense of wonder, and daring to imagine. Cool. With that, I will thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any more questions.